am Professor Patrick. Professor. Doctor Professor Patrick. Welcome back. We're going to finish things off with immunology, dermatology, and ENT. So some of the learning objectives here are to differentiate the causes of adult immunodeficiency, to identify common AIDS-associated infections, and characterize and manage some selected zoonotic infections. So for immunodeficiency cases, we've got a 36-year-old woman with a family history of celiac disease who presents for a GI bug. She has a history of three prior pneumonia infections in the past year. This would be an IgA deficiency, so a mucosal deficiency, especially pneumonias, URIs, and gastrointestinal infections. The next step would be an immunoglobulin measurement, um, just a total IgG, IgA, etc. And then anaphylaxis with blood transfusion is a feared complication here. Next case is a 23-year-old who presents with recurrent ear and lung infections over the past year. He had a normal childhood development and received all recommended vaccinations. Um, the diagnosis would be common variable immunodeficiency, and you can treat this with IVIG. It commonly presents between like 18 and 25. Next case is a 28-year-old who presents with mucopurulent vaginal discharge and abdominal pain. She's had three episodes of Neisseria, including disseminated infections in her lifetime, as well as yearly community-acquired pneumonias. So this is a complement deficiency. Um, it increases your risk of gonorrhea infections, and it can be confirmed with ELISA. You want to treat pneumonia and H flu vaccines aggressively. Next, we've got a 59-year-old undergoing induction chemotherapy for diffuse B-cell lymphoma who presents with fever and chills on day 5. Labs show WBCs of 0 0.9 with an ANC of 105. So this is neutropenia and neutropenic fevers. The next best step is to do blood, urine, CSF cultures. And you can treat with cefepime, miropenem, or piptazo. You can add vancomycin if there's catheter or soft tissue infections. It increases the risk of gram-positive infections. And after four to seven days, if this persists, you can add antifungals as well. So going through acute retroviral infections, so we've got a 21-year-old who presents with one-week history of sore throat and fatigue. He has had intermittent fevers, sore throat, and a rash on his chest and back. He just returned from a college trip to Southeast Asia two weeks ago. Vital signs show a temperature of 38.5, BP of 125 over 72, heart rate of 79, and respiratory rate of 14. On exam, there is cervical lymphadenopathy, splenomegaly, and an erythematous macular rash on the chest and back. So this is likely an acute um, retroviral infection. Um, it happens two to four weeks after exposure, and the next best step would be a P24 antigen and viral load. You can follow up again in six weeks. Sometimes it's negative on the first result because it's too acute. Um, the signs and symptoms can present anywhere from two to four weeks after exposure, and you would want to treat everyone and anyone with heart therapy. So some of the drug classes, you have your NRTIs, which all end in ein, plus abacavir and tenofovir, some of the earlier versions. You have your NNRTIs, which have a vir in the middle. And then you have your protease inhibitors, which end in navir. And then you also have integrase inhibitors. So if you want to prophylax someone with AIDS, um, anyone with a CD4 greater than 200 can get all their live vaccines. Anyone with the CD4 less than 200 should be treated with TMP SMX. And anyone less than 50 on a CD4 needs azithromycin as well. So some of the AIDS-defining illnesses. So say this 36-year-old with a history of IV drug use has non-peritic reddish-brown lesions, a low-grade fever, and significant weight loss. This can signify Kaposi sarcoma. And you would want to treat these with radiation and chemotherapy using atopicide, denoxyrubicin, bleomycin, and binblastin. If there were large reddish pedunculated exophytic skin lesions that bleed easily and a liver mass, you can think of bacillary angiomatosis, and you can treat this with doxycycline or erythromycin. If there's persistent cough and shortness of breath, um, intestinal infiltrations or ground glass on x-ray, silver stain with yeast, you can think of pneumocystis pneumonia, PJP or PCP pneumonia. You want to treat with Bactrim. You can also use Dapsone and Pyrimethazine or Pentamine or Atovaquin. And it's important to add steroids if their oxygen is less than 70 or if their A to A is greater than 35. 
So somebody with a cough and high fever um, and headaches, you want to do an LP. And if there's high opening pressure and lymphocytosis, you can also see a positive India ink stain. This would be cryptococcus. And this can be treated with amphotericin B and flucytosine. Next, if somebody had watery diarrhea for two months that's not responding to antibiotics or antiparasites, you can do a stool study with oocytes and acid fast stain. If this was positive, you could think of cryptosporidium, which treatment would be highly active antiretroviral to get their CD4 count above 100 and symptomatic treatment of the diarrhea. If somebody had watery diarrhea, abdominal pains, high fevers, and night sweats, they had shortness of breath and lymphadenopathy, and their CD4 count was less than 50, this can be MAC, or disseminated mycobacterium avium complex. So you would treat this with macrolide plus ethambutol with or without rifabutin. So more AIDS-defining illnesses. Say the same patient had fever, headache, and an ear infection. And on head CT, you saw this ring-enhancing lesion. A single one could signify a brain abscess, and you would want to treat by drainage and antibiotics. If there was a new onset seizure and they loved undercooked meats, you could think of neurosarcosis, and you would want to treat this with albendazole. It comes from undercooked pork. Next would be multiple lesions, uh, multiple ring-enhancing lesions on CT, and the diagnosis would be toxoplasmosis. <clears throat> and you can treat with pyrimethazine and sulfadiazine or atovaquin. And if there is a single ring-enhancing lesion that does not go away with antibiotics, you would start to think of a central lymphoma, and you would need to do a bone biopsy or brain biopsy and treat it with CHOP. So some animal-borne or zoonotic infections. If there's a 37-year-old hiker from New Jersey who presents with a rash and headache, on exam the rash has central clearing and it appears targetoid, you would think of Lyme disease due to Borrelia burgdorferi. It's transmitted by the Ixodes tick and you can treat it with doxycycline or ceftriaxone. If there is a tick attached for greater than 36 hours and you're in an endemic area, um, you can also prophylax with doxycycline. So if you're an 18-year-old hiking in North Carolina, presenting with fever, lightheadedness, and rash, the rash began around her ankles and wrists and spread centrally. This is classic for Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, and it's transmitted by the dermacenter tick, and you would treat this with doxycycline for everyone, even your pediatric patients. Next is a 21-year-old new military recruit. He presents with arthralgias, myalgia, a rash, and a cough. He says he feels faint and dizzy. On exam, there's a rash centrally that spares the hands and feet. This would be rickettsia prowatsi. It's spread by lice. It's common in um, high infectious areas like military boarding recruits or um, refugee camps. And you can treat this with doxycycline or chloramphenicol for everyone around. Next case is a 57-year-old farmer um, who presents with headache, fatigue, and fever. Labs show thrombocytopenia, lymphopenia, and transaminitis. His condition worsens and he begins to show signs of confusion and respiratory distress. So this is ehrlichiosis that's spread by the lone star tick. And you can diagnose this with, or treat this with doxycycline or rifampin. You would diagnose with serologies. Next is a 34 year old from Arkansas who presents with painful ulcers and buboes in his left axilla. He admits to hunting small woodland creatures about two weeks ago. And this would be tularemia. It's spread by ticks on rabbits, and you can treat this with streptomycin. Next, we've got a case of a 53-year-old goat herder who develops abrupt cough, high fevers, diaphoresis, and headaches. Labs show elevated AST and ALT, and this is Q fever. It's self-resolving, and it's spread by spores, um, oftentimes around livestock. Next case is a 29-year-old woman who presents with undulating fevers for two weeks. She's had no travel history to a malaria-prone area, but she admits to eating unpasteurized milk cheeses from a friend's farm. This would be brucella, and you can treat this with doxycycline and rifampin. Next case is a 74-year-old woman who's attacked by a skunk in daylight when she was trying to separate her Yorkshire Terrier. Next step would be to do a rabies immunoglobulin and rabies vaccine. Um, if at all possible, you want to quarantine the animal as well. Uh, but the rabies vaccine series is every 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 13, 21, etc. days for a 30-day trial. 
Um, next, we've got a 54-year-old with HIV who presents for fever and rash. The rash is spread from his arm to his axilla, and there's prominent lymphadenopathy. So you want to look at cat scratch disease due to Bartonella hensley, and you can treat this with doxycycline or, erythrom or azithromycin. And last, we've got a 23-year-old world traveler who presents with fever and conjunctivitis. On exam, there's mild jaundice, and hepatitis serologies are all negative. So this can be leptospirosis. It's spread by animal urine. You want to watch out in tropical areas for this. And you want to look for wheels disease or kidney and liver failure caused by this. Next case is a 45-year-old returning from Egypt, and he presents with fever, chills, nausea, back pain, and headaches. On exam, he appears jaundiced with a painful liver, and this is yellow fever. Mortality is severe, and it approaches 50%. It's spread by the Aedes aegypti uh, mosquito, and a live vaccine is available for travelers leaving the United States. Next is a 25-year-old returning from a honeymoon cruise to Brazil. She presents with fever, headache, conjunctivitis, and a macular rash. She's currently trying to conceive with her husband, and this would be worrisome for Zika virus. It's spread by the Aedes aegypti mosquito, and it can cause microcephaly and pregnant mothers and GBS. A 38-year-old on vacation in Florida presents with high fever for two days, followed by headaches and joint pain. On exam, there are no meningitis signs. However, there is a mild macular rash on the trunk, and this is common of either chikungunya or West Nile virus. It is also spread by the Aedes aegypti um, or Colvex mosquitoes, and you can diagnose these with serologies. Next is a 42-year-old African missionary who presents with sudden onset fever and joint pain. He is hypotensive and tachycardic. On exam, there is a rash on the trunk resembling islands of white on a sea of red, and this is dengue fever. It's also spread by the Aedes aegypti, and you can diagnose this with serology. This case in particular is breakneck fever, um, and this is often a more severe infection if you get a second um, type of dengue fever. So the second infection is worse and causes more of a hemorrhagic fever. Next is a 30-year-old immigrant from South Sudan who presents with a long-standing fever, malaise, and weight loss. On exam, a spleen tip is palpated. Her husband also has a cutaneous lesion resembling leprosy on his face. The diagnosis here would be leishmania or Kala Azar. You can diagnose this by parasites and macrophages on blood smear, and it's spread by the sand fly. You want to treat this with amphotericin B and miltificin. Now we're going to go into the dermatology section. So a lot of these will be short cases with a picture. So some of the learning objectives are to classify dermatologic diseases through visual and verbal descriptions. So a picture is worth a thousand words and the dermatologists know all 1000 of those words and that's why they get paid the big dollars. Next, we're going to provide management plans for infectious and immune dermatologic conditions and then associate dermatologic findings with common internal pathologies. So first up, we have cellulitis. It's a case of a 25-year-old with fever, chills, and a bright, angry erythematous patch on his leg following a bug bite. The next step would be to do blood cultures, and your treatment is going to be vancomycin empirically, and then you can de-escalate to acephalosporin or penicillin once you have sensitivities. Next is necrotizing fasciitis. This is a case of a 39-year-old woman presenting with rapidly expanding area of necrosis and erythema following a road burn. Imaging suggests gas within the soft tissue, and the treatment here is emergent surgical debridement and hyperbaric oxygen. Next, we've got acne vulgaris, an 18-year-old presenting with open comedones and pustules that leave scars. The treatment here is going to be a step-up therapy. The first um, trial would be topical benzoyl peroxide. You want to watch because this can bleach clothes. Then you do topical retinoids, which are now over-the-counter. You can try topical antibiotics prescription and oral antibiotics, and then finally oral retinoids or Accutane is the last um, step up. And you can consider spironolactone and those that you think are hormonally affected. Next case is rosacea. This is a 39-year-old Caucasian woman presenting with erythema, telangiectasias, and pustules around the nose and nasolabial folds, and these worsen with wine intake. The treatment is gonna to be topical metronidazole and oral tetracycline and topical retinoids. And in men, this can progress to rhinophyma 
which is an enlarged um, nose. Next case is molluscum contagiosum. This is going to be an 18-year-old wrestler who presents with a dome-shaped papules and central umbilications. You want to treat these with cuterage and podophyllin drops and cryotherapy. Next is varicania vulgaris or warts. And this is a 26-year-old teacher who presents with hyperkeratotic growths on her fingers and elbows that bleed when bumped. You can try cryotherapy, salicylic acid, or amiquamod here. Next is tinea versicolor. This is an 18-year-old boy from Florida who has well-demarcated hyper and hypopigmented macules on his trunk and upper extremities. When you scrape with a KOH, there is spaghetti and meatball pattern and that's diagnostic for tinea. You want to treat this with selenium sulfide or antifungal creams, and it's worsened by going into the sun. In vitiligo, we've got a 23-year-old Indian woman with a family history of Addison's disease who presents with sharply demarcated amelanotic patches on the face and extremities. Treatment would be steroids and phototherapy. Next, we've got a case of seborrheic dermatitis. So a 27-year-old male presents with pruritic yellow scales with associated flaking skin on his scalp, eyebrows, and upper lip. You can try dandruff shampoo, ketoconazole, or hydrocortisone on there. For pityriasis rosea, we've got a 36-year-old woman presenting with pruritic erythematous plaques on her thighs that have since spread down her leg. You can treat with antihistamines for pruritus and associated with um, herpes simplex 7. Next is a case of erythasma. It's a 47-year-old construction worker who presents with pruritic erythematous brown patches in the skin folds of the axilla with an associated scale. The lesion fluoresces coral pink underneath a woods lamp. The treatment would be topical antibiotics or benzoyl hydroxide. Next is an inner trigo. This is a 53-year-old woman who presents with a painful erythematous patch under her breast with associated satellite macules, and this would not fluoresce under Wood's lamp. The treatment would be antifungals and avoiding wet conditions. Next is cutaneous larva migraines. It's a 27-year-old who presents with erythematous tortuous tract with intense pain and pruritus following a romantic trip to Cancun. Um, so you can treat these with mebendazole, ivermectin, or cryotherapy, and this is often due to raccoon droppings found in the sand. Next is HS hydradenitis superta, and it's a 28-year-old obese man who presents with painful nodules and sinus tracts in his axilla and gluteal cleft. The treatment is clindamycin and simvastatin, and you can also trial anti-TNF alpha inhibitors. Next, there's the case of erythema multiform. A 32-year-old man presents with erythematous macules and papules that form targetoid lesions on his hand and chest following a walking pneumonia, uh, and he was treated with penicillin. The treatment would be remove the offending agent and give antihistamines and analgesics, so it's associated with mycoplasma pneumonia and certain drugs like penicillins. Next, a case of Steven Johnson syndrome. A 21-year-old with a history of seizure disorder on phenytoin and carbamazepine presents with extensive targetoid lesions, including bullae on the mouth and eyes. So the treatment here would be to admit to a burn unit for hydration, wound care, and monitoring the airway. Next is lichen planus, a case of a 63-year-old woman presenting with purple pruritic papules and polygonal plaques on her wrist and ankles. The treatment would be topical steroids, tacrolimus, or steroid injections. Next, there's psoriasis. We've got a case of a 20-year-old male with multiple large plaques with associated scale that has pinpoint bleeding on elbows, knees, scalp, and back. He later develops nail pitting and joint pain. The treatment would be topical emollients like steroids, calcineurin inhibitors, and systemic immunomodulation. And there's also evidence for a post-streptococcal or gutate psoriasis where there are small teardrop-shaped um, plaques that form within 6 to 12 months um, after a strep infection all over the trunk. Next is pemphigus vulgaris. There's a case of a 58-year-old Jewish man who develops multiple vesicles and belay in the mouth and face that easily rupture. The treatment is going to be immunosuppression and antibiotics. 
and then the um, antibody to know here is anti-desmosome IgG. And we compare that with bullous pemphigoid with an 84-year-old man who presents with extremely pyritic tense belay that are difficult to rupture, so negative Nikolskis. And you treat this with steroids and immunomodulators, and the antibody of note is an anti-hemidesmosome IgG antibody. Next is urticaria, where there's an 18-year-old woman who presents with erythematous pyritic wheels and papules after contact with peanuts. Treatment would be antihistamines and steroids. And then there's contact dermatitis. There's a 45-year-old construction worker who presents with erythematous papules and vesicles with oozing that gives way to crusting lichenoid skin on his hands. The treatment would be steroids and avoidant of any irritant or allergen. It's usually a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction, and in some cases it's due to contact with cement, like in construction workers, and that's due to the chromium in the cement. Next is herpes zoster. So we have a 67-year-old woman who presents with a burning sensation on her face that precedes an erythematous grouped vesicles in differing stages of healing and a dermatomal distribution. And for treatment, you can try acyclovir, and gabapentin is used for post-herpatic neuralgia, or pain persistent after the wounds heal. There's also a Ramsey-Hunt syndrome um, and herpatic opto optomaplegia. So Ramsey-Hunt syndrome is going to be um, where the herpes zoster actually infects the interior of the ear. And herpatic optomaplegia is going to be um, a sign where you can see vesicles on the tip of the nose and it actually spreads all the way back v1 into the eye and shingrix vaccine is better at preventing than the zostavax so please update everyone um, in your panel to have a shingrix vaccine next is scabies a 41 year old homeless man presents with extremely pyritic linear marks on the interdigits of his web um, wrists and groin scrapings confirm the diagnosis um, and you want to treat with permethrin cream or lindane lotion. And you want to treat all clothes and bedding with hot and bleach water. Next, we're going to compare erythema nodosum and pyoderma gangrenosum. So we've got a 25-year-old um, who presents with painful erythematous nodules on the shins bilaterally. And this is associated with sarcoidosis, Crohn's disease, dimorphic yeast infections, and drugs. Next is a pyoderma gangrenosum. So we have a case of a 28-year-old with UC who presents with a rapidly progressing necrolytic cutaneous ulcer with irregular borders. This is associated with UC, RA, and Wegner's. Next is a seborrheic keratosis. Uh, this is a case of a 67-year-old sailor who presents with a pyritic, waxy, greasy, brown, raised, stuck-on appearing papule. And you want to treat these with cryotherapy or shave biopsies, but they're completely benign, so this is only if they're causing symptoms. Moving into the cancers, there's a basal cell carcinoma, a case of a 74-year-old farmer who presents with a pearly papule with rolled borders and associated telangiectasias on the lower lip. Treatment is going to be biopsy with cryotherapy or Mohs surgery. Next is actinic keratosis. This is a 54-year-old woman who presents with a scaly lesion on an erythematous base along her forehead and ears. You can treat these with cryotherapy or topical 5-FU. So these are precursors to squamous cell carcinomas. In the next case, we've got a 61-year-old farmer who presents with a crusting erythematous papule on his upper lip that's become pruritic and bleeds. And we want to treat this with biopsy, um, surgical removal, or Mohs surgery. Moving into melanoma, this is a 44-year-old Caucasian woman who presents with a rapidly changing pigmented macule with irregular borders and color on her upper back. Treatment is going to be diagnostic excision with a 3 millimeter margin, and then treatment depends on the depth and the regional lymphatic involvement. Keratoacanthomas are a subtype of squamous cell carcinomas. We've got a case of a 76-year-old woman who presents with a rapidly growing craterous lesion with central necrosis on her scalp. You want to treat these with a shave biopsy or you can do intralesional methotrexate. Moving on to the eye, some of the learning objectives are to identify common eyelid pathologies and select treatments, contrast the causes of red eye or conjunctivitis, and evaluate the patient with acute vision loss 
and distinguish the causes of eye pain. So in the eyelid, we've got a case of a 28-year-old who presents with painful swollen mass on the eyelid margin. So on the margin, you can consider an hordeolum or a common staph infection that responds well to warm compress or IND. Next case is a 45-year-old who presents with recurrent painful swollen mass on the eyelid that is non-tender and rubbery. So this is a chalazion or a granulomatous condition where obstructions of the mebian gland it can progress to malignancy, so you want to treat with biopsy and steroid injection. Lastly, we've got a case of a 59-year-old who presents with acute pain and redness in the medial canthal region. On exam, pus can be expressed, and this is a dacrylitis. It's infection due to staph or group A beta hemolytic streptococci, and you treat with systemic antibiotics. Going into the conjunctivitis, we've got a case of a 25-year-old school teacher with a red eye. She has purulent white yellow discharge that causes her eye to be stuck shut in the morning. She does not wear any contacts and her vision is 20-20. So this is more likely bilateral or bacterial conjunctivitis. You want to treat with erythromycin ointment, polymyxin eye drops or fluoroquinolone eye drops, um, especially in contact users. There's an increased risk of pseudomonas. Next case is a 37-year-old father of two who presents with a red eye. He complains of scant music, mucus discharge and a sandy feeling. There is no photophobia and vision is undisturbed. And this is more likely a viral conjunctivitis. You can treat with warm compress and antihistamine eye drops symptomatically. Lastly, we've got a 42-year-old woman who presents with red eyes. She complains of irresistible urge to itch her eyes and a feeling of swollen eyelids. She has a history of allergies and she denies any headaches. And on exam, her eye exam was benign. Her diagnosis is going to be allergic conjunctivitis, and you can treat with over-the-counter antihistamines and antihistamine eye drops. Next, we've got a case of a 24-year-old who presents with a painful red eye. He wears contacts to bed frequently, and on exam, there is opacification and ulceration of the cornea. This is a contact lens-associated keratinitis, and you're going to treat with this an emergent ophthalmologic um, referral with removal of the contact and broad spectrum antibiotics. Next is a 33 year old lifeguard who presents with painful blurred vision with tearing and redness. On exam, there's photophobia with corneal vesicles and a dendritic ulcer. This is an HSV keratitis. You want to treat with topical or oral antivirals. Next, we've got a 71 year old woman with a history of RA who's on methotrexate. She presents with fever, malaise, and burning, itching in the periorbital region. On exam, there's a vesicular rash in the V1 distribution, and this can lead to zoster ophthalmoliacus. You can treat with high-dose acyclovir. Last, there is a 18-year-old baseball player who presents with severe pain and photophobia following a fastball to the face. Slit lamp exam with fluorescein shows an abrasion. This is in a corneal abrasion, and you can treat by removal of any foreign body and preventing infection with antibiotics. You don't need to give them a pirate eye patch unless they insist. Next, we're moving into uveitis and retinitis. There's a case of a 27-year-old with ankylosing spondylitis who, pre who presents with significant eye pain, meiosis, and photophobia. Examination shows keratotic precipitates of the mutton fat and the iris nodules. This is an anterior uveitis. It's associated with HLA B27 and juvenile idiopathic arthritis, and systemic or topical steroids are needed for treatment. We've got a 33-year-old man with AIDS who's presenting with a painless blurred vision, floaters, and photopsia. His last CD4 was 54, and fundoscopy shows yellow-white fluffy hemorrhagic lesions along the vasculature, and this can be due to activation of CMV retinitis. You want to treat with oral valgancyclovir and heart. And last, we have a case of a 54-year-old woman with lupus and a history of kidney transplant who presents with painful conjunctivitis and vision loss. Fundoscopy reveals widespread pale peripheral lesions and central necrosis of the retina. And this is HSV or VZV retinitis. You want to treat with oral antivirals and steroids. Moving into vision loss, there's a case of a 58-year-old man with a history of metabolic syndrome and smoking who presents with 45-minute episode of monoarticular blindness that is resolved. 
The diagnosis would be amaurosis fugax because of the resolving nature. This is a TIA of the ophthalmologic artery. The next best step with amaurosis is to do a carotid ultrasound and treat of atherosclerotic disease. Next is a 73-year-old woman with AFib who presents with 30-minute history of monoarticular vision loss. Fundoscopic exam shows diffuse ischemic retinal whitening, pale optic disc, and a cherry red fovea. So this is a central retinal artery occlusion. It's caused by emboli thrombus or giant cell temporal arteritis. And you want to treat with emergent ocular massage and thrombolytic therapy. Next case is a 61-year-old male with a history of liver failure who wakes up with monoarticular vision loss. On fundoscopic exam, there is disc swelling, venous dilation and tortuosity, and retinal hemorrhages. So this is a central retinal vein occlusion, and you can treat these with anti-VEGF injections. Last, there is a 57-year-old with a history of cataract surgery, presenting with months of photopsia, floaters, and an hour ago there was a sudden curtain coming down effect over one eye. A gray elevated retina is seen on ophthalmoscopy. Treatment is a, or diagnosis is a retinal detachment. You can treat this with laser therapy, cryotherapy, or pneumatic retina pexy. Moving on to glaucoma and others, we've got a 57 year old who presents with acute pain and blurry vision when walking into a dark room. On exam, a red eye with a steamy or hazy cornea and a dilated pupil that is not reactive to light. This is acute angle glaucosia. Close your glaucoma. The next best step is emergent opto-referral for tonometry. Treat with mannitol and acetazolamide before laser peripheral ideometry. Next is a 25-year-old woman who presents with eye pain when moving. She states that colors seem more washed out, and she has a history of eye and neuromuscular complaints in the past year. This is optic neuritis, and it's associated with MS. You can treat this with steroids. Next, we've got a 61-year-old African-American man with diabetes who presents with gradual loss of peripheral vision. A pathologic cupping of the optic disc is apparent on exam. You can diagnose open angle glaucoma, and you can treat with timolol or laser trabeculae. And the importance of prevention by screening different risk groups. A 69-year-old woman with a history of RA living in Florida with painless blurry vision and glare that she has while driving at night because of difficulty seeing around the halos caused by oncoming lights. On exam, there is loss of the red reflex bilaterally. The diagnosis here would be cataracts disease, and the risks include age, diabetes, smoking, chronic sunlight exposure, and glucocorticoid use. You want to treat with lens extraction and artificial lens implantation. So here are some eyeballs here. First, pi or first picture, you can see the Kaiser Flesher rings in the outside. And then conjunctivitis here, we've got a um, mucopurulent discharge. Next is a retinal detachment, so you can see the gray membrane at the top. And next is corneal abrasion. Here is CMV retinitis with the fluffy um, picture in the cornea. And then HSV retinitis where it seems more washed out. Here's a central retinal artery occlusion, so you can't see any of the um, vasculature getting to the fovea and a central retinal vein occlusion that looks more like um, Jupiter with a lot of tortuous veins and bleeding. Here's acute angle closure glaucoma, so that hazy eye with tortuous vesicles and a stuck pupil, and then a cataracts. Going into otolaryngology now, we've got a 63-year-old woman who says, I feel dizzy, so different causes of dizziness. She describes the room as spinning, and it's made worse by moving her head, She's very nauseous. This would be BPPV, and you want to treat this with meclizine and cochlear therapy to um, relieve the otolith. Next, she describes feeling lightheaded when rising from a chair or standing up. Her heart races and her vision goes black from time to time. She is on HCTZ for hypertension, and her blood pressure drops from 127 over 78 to 104 over 57 when she stands. This would be orthostatic hypertension. You want to treat this with fluids and slow positional changes. Next, she has had cold leading up to this feeling, and she describes the room as spinning and ringing sound in her ears. So this could be a vestibular neuritis or labyrinthitis. You wanna treat this with antihistamines. Next, she's had an increased attacks of room spinning for months, and she has a history of hearing loss and tinnitus. 
So this is Meniere's disease, and you want to treat this with diuretics. And then if she had a sudden onset syncope, and then a persistent feeling of vertigo that lasts for 24 hours, this is more verte uh, verte vertebrobacillar insufficiency, and you want to do an MRI or a CTA of the posterior circulation and treat with secondary stroke preventions. Some more ear things. We've got a case of a 32-year-old woman presenting with hearing loss. She described having difficulty hearing low sounds. On exam, bone conduction is greater than air conduction. So this is autosclerosis. You can treat with surgical um, stapedectomy. Next, we have a case of a 63-year-old man complaining of difficulty hearing people in crowded spaces. His wife complains that he always turns up the volume so loud she can hear it in the other room. On exam, air conduction is greater than bone conduction, and this is prebiscus. It's treated with hearing aids. Next, we've got a 46-year-old with HIV who complains of difficulty hearing in his left ear. On exam, bone conduction is greater than air conduction, and the sound lateralizes to his affected ear. On otoscopic exam, there is a dull hypomobile tympanic membrane of the left ear. So this is a serous otitis media. You can treat the HIV and trial decongestants um, to remove the fluid. Last, there's a 67-year-old with diabetes who's swimming for exercises in his local pool and develops a painful ear. On exam, there's purulent discharge and pain when palpating the pinea. Diagnosis would be malignant otitis externa, and you want to treat with anti-pseudomonal antibiotics, so ciprofloxacin drops. Next is adenophagia. So we've got a 18-year-old high school student presenting with a sore throat, fever, and fatigue. On exam, he's febrile with inflamed tonsils and a palpable spleen tip. So this can be Epstein-Barr's or mono, and it's confirmed with a heterophile antibody test or blood smears showing atypical lymphocytes. It's associated with Burkitt's lymphoma and nasopharyngeal carcinomas. And for treatment, you can do symptomatic relief with lozenges, NSAIDs, and Tylenol. And there is no contact sports for four to six weeks after this resolves due to the risk of splenic ruptures. Comparing that with a 44-year-old man who develops a sore throat and odenophagia, he denies cough, rhinorrhea, or conjunctivitis. On exam, he is febrile with tender lymphadenopathy, and he has an erythematous tonsil with exudates. So this is acute streptococcal pharyngitis. So you can do your um, centaur criteria, looking for fever, lymphadenopathy, absence of cough, exudates, and age. The next step would be a rapid strep test in culture. And your treatment is going to be oral penicillin or amoxicillin, unless there was previous antibiotics use within 30 days. Then you can do oral amoxicillin clavulanic acid. So some of the references, I used uh, x-rays from Radiopedia. I got all my EKGs from Life in the Fast Lane. Dermatologic images were from DermNet. And the Awkward Yeti has all the characterized and personalized organs. Thanks for listening. Um, and stay tuned for pediatrics, ob and some other videos. I am Professor Patrick. Professor. Doctor Professor Patrick. <laughs>